Good afternoon. Um, welcome to the August 26, 2022 uh, meeting of the uh, General Bond Neighborhood and City Services Subcommittee. I hereby call this meeting to order. Uh, we have uh, uh, interpreters today for our Spanish-speaking participants. Would you please introduce yourselves? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon, my name is Elsie Duarte, and along with my colleague, Mario Barajas, we will be servicing as interpreters in today's meeting. I will now introduce myself to our Spanish-speaking audience. Buenas tardes, mi nombre es Elsie Duarte y junto con mi colega Mario Barajas estaremos sirviéndoles como intérpretes en la reunión de hoy. Al momento de hacer un comentario público, de favor les pedimos que hable despacio, con claridad y deténgase después de cada pocas oraciones para interpretarle de la manera más completa posible. Gracias. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, there will be a... Uh, public comment period uh, during item three of today's agenda. I'm planning to reserve at least 30 minutes for public comments, but I will decide the duration and time limit for each speaker based on the availability time and the number of individuals uh, registered to speak. If you are attending in person and would like to speak, you will need to sign up at the kiosk located at the entrance of the council chambers before item three begins. If you are attending virtually or watching recor a recording, I would like to speak, I would like to speak at the, f and would like to speak at the future GL Bond committee meeting. You will need to register at least two hours prior to the start of the meeting. You may register to speak at uh, phoenix.gov slash bond slash meeting. One of our first agenda items is to approval of minutes from the last meeting. Do I have a motion? I motion to approve the uh, meeting minutes from August 12th, 2022. I'd like to second. We have a motion and we have a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Anyone in the um, decline? Okay. All right. Thank you very much. During uh, this meeting, we will be going over follow-up items from our first meeting. The subcommittee has received comments from the public and members have their own versions visions of uh, priority capital needs, we will continue to receive more input today. As the subcommittee hears presentations and public comments today, I will ask that members keep their mind, keep in mind we have limited time to reach our recommendations. We are tasked with identifying and prioritizing list of projects to recommend to the executive committee no later than the second scheduled subcommittee meeting. There will not be additional meetings scheduled. As a reminder, the city has not had a geo bond program since 2006, and the significant need exists that exceeds the 500 million scope approved by the city council the subcommittee should also consider projects a higher priority that would ensure city facilities and infrastructures can continue and be accessible and safe for operation. We have two meetings after today to finalize the prioritized list of projects, recommendations to the executive committee. No later than the third meeting, the subcommittee will be needed to have a list of projects identified and no later than the fourth meeting, those projects will need to be ranked in priority, priority order, concluding with a final report to the executive committee. 
to assist in the subcommittee with the prioritizing pr projects, staff has developed a method facilitating the uh, decisions on prioritization and will brief us today on the process following the next agenda items. Finally, the city has scheduled a public hearing for the executive committee on September 14th at 6 p.m. for purposes of engaging the public and hearing comments regarding the overall bond program. I encourage you to listen to the discussion so you can hear the input received from the residents. Due to open meeting laws requirements, subcommittee members should not plan to attend the meeting in person. One final note, committee members, you received a backup memo yesterday from staff requesting some to, to some of our questions from the last meetings regarding the Matthew Henson and the Orpheum Theater operations as we move to this next uh, item three discussion. It is appropriate for all of you that you have questions on the information and to raise it after the staff presentations. Just a friendly reminder to help us all stay organized. Okay. Our next agenda item <coughs> is for follow-up discussion and public comments regarding the capital needs and uh, discussion of the subcommittee process for prioritizing the capital needs. And I will be, and I will, sure I got this right. I will turn the meeting over to the staff to respond to the questions and requests from the last meeting. At the conclusion of the discussion of, on capital needs, we will have staff go over possible methods for prioritizing projects. All right, thank you, uh, Chairman James, members of the subcommittee. Um, I want to introduce a few staff that are up here uh, as part of our, our presentation panel, and then we do have some other uh, staff that uh, may come up from time to time that are experts in particular areas, depending on your questions as we get into that uh, at the end here. So uh, I'm Alan Stevenson, uh, Deputy City Manager, and uh, starting all the way down on my right here uh, is Mr. Uh, Paul Lee, uh, representing the Law Department, who's the attorney to the subcommittee here. Uh, Mr. Adam Miller representing the Budget and Research Department. Uh, Ms. Karen Peters, who is uh, co-chair with this committee with me uh, from uh, the staff standpoint and, and deputy city manager. And then Rita Hamilton, the city librarian. Uh, and Chris Yule, who is with the Public Works Department. And we will uh, jump into our presentation and then we are, are happy to answer uh, subcommittee questions and, and go from there. So with that, I'll turn over to Rita. Thank you, Alan, subcommittee chair and members of the subcommittee. Today, I'm happy to follow up on the questions from our last session. To refresh your memory, Phoenix Public Library is a 17 location library system that has been serving generations of Phoenicians for almost 125 years. Our locations range in size from the smallest at 6,500 square feet to our flagship Burton Bar Central Library at 280,000 square feet. Our most recent location is our joint library with South Mountain Community College, which opened in 2011. Phoenix, as the fifth largest city, has half the library locations as compared to other cities of similar size. Two new library locations and an expansion of the Yucca Library have been identified as pr prioritized projects. This will offer positive impact and benefits to the hundreds of thousands of current customers that use Phoenix Public Library throughout the year, as well as the thousands of families making their homes in newly developed Phoenix neighborhoods. During our session with you on August 12th, we were asked to provide more details about all the services our libraries offer to our communities. 
Currently, our residents count on Phoenix Public Libraries for being able to check out materials, both in person and online. In a typical year, we circulate 10 to 12 million library items, but we're more than just books. We host approximately 4 million visits a year in which our visitors can enjoy a quiet place to read, find a program like a book discussion, story time, or an art or Arizona history program, or learn a new skill. And each summer, Phoenix Public Libraries also serve as cooling centers and serve meals to children through our Kids Cafe partnership. Residents can rely on Phoenix Public Library for access to highly trained experts who can provide personalized assistance in building a child's literacy and school readiness through programs such as kindergarten boot camp, story times, tools for school, and Wizards of Steam. Applying for college and financial aid with College Access Advisors and College Depot, drafting a business plan with local small business expertise in Startup Phoenix, or writing a resume and looking for a job or expanding a career with Phoenix Works programs. As a community gathering space, Phoenix Public Libraries provide cultural experiences, study and meeting rooms, and we are a digital safety net. All 17 locations offer daily access to computers and the internet. We provide Wi-Fi that is available inside each location and throughout our parking lots. We have Wi-Fi hotspots and laptops available for lending. And we provide expertise that helps people use technology through workshops and personalized assistance. At the last session, we were asked about economic, the economic impact of public libraries. While we have not conducted a study in Phoenix, recent research into the benefits brought to communities through public libraries have consistently found investing in libraries has created economic opportunities for both the community at large and individual library users. For instance, research is starting to show that public libraries improve the academic performance of children. Citing his working paper, The Returns to Public Library Investment, published by the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago in 2021, Dr. Gregory Gilpin writes on a Brookings Institute blog, on average, a new public library results in increases to student reading achievement that are 29% the size of those associated with opening a new elementary school building and at 15% of the cost of the new school. We know that one of the greatest predictors of future educational and career success is reading on grade level by third grade. Achievement of educational and career success can lead to millions of dollars in economic and social gains for communities. Phoenix Public Library's fundamental mission is to offer resources and expertise that support early literacy skills development for the children in Phoenix. Public libraries are a pioneer of the sharing economy model. By offering a wide variety of items available to borrow, libraries add economic benefit as well as reducing waste and supporting environmental sustainability. Additional research supports the belief that public libraries improve economies by helping people find jobs, provide resources to entrepreneurs, and increasing the traffic and potential spending for the surrounding businesses of the new libraries. For individual and family library users, everything offered through our libraries is free. Customers save money by streaming movies, shows, and music from platforms such as Canopy and Hoopla. They have free access to magazines and newspapers on Flipster and Pressreader, and databases such as Consumer Reports and Ancestry. Our system provides an estimate of the amount of money saved by using the library rather than purchasing the book. When you check out an item from the Phoenix Public Library, your printed receipt will give you an estimate of the dollars you saved. In fiscal year 21-22, it could be said our customers saved almost $998 million by finding books at their library. For those members of our community that don't have Wi-Fi in their home, they can check out Wi-Fi hotspots for free 
saving them the monthly su subscription fee. In fiscal year 21-22, hundreds of thousands of Phoenix Public Library visitors accessed our free Wi-Fi almost 4.3 million times. Across our system, 730 public computers are used over 700,000 hours a year. College Depot offers students a long-term checkout periods for laptops and Wi-Fi hotspots, ensuring students have access to a computer and the internet for an entire semester. Since 2011, Phoenix has become the fifth largest U.S. city with a population of 1.7 million. Phoenix continues to regularly be ranked as one of the fastest growing cities in the country. Increasing Yucca Library's capacity and adding two new library locations will expand economic, cultural, and education benefits to these growing communities. Thank you for your attention and support of our libraries. I will turn this over to Chris Ewell, Assistant Public Works Director. Chair James, members of the subcommittee, um, happy to come back uh, to you today in uh, Joe DeGiuse's place. He's traveling today, um, so I hope he's not here today. But um, to share a little bit more information about our ADA um, compliance improvement um, uh, program, this scalable program uh, will provide uh, ongoing funding to help us ensure compliance with the Americans with Disabilities Act at general funded city facilities. It is a pool of funding that we can use um, at any general funded um, uh, facility. Uh, so in, since the 90s, the, the city has been uh, doing ongoing assessments and improvements. And in uh, 2021, the city did hire a consultant, uh, a third party consultant to help us complete self-assessments at all general funded uh, facilities. Uh, they are using the current ADA standards for these assessments, and they're generating transition plans which will help us um, identify areas out of compliance, recommend corrective action, as well as give us a priority ranking for um, uh, pro projects. Uh, this process is expected to take several years to complete. And um, again, uh, ADA compliance issues are prioritized based on the level of them in terms of things like uh, does it prevent access into a facility or does it just prevent um, uh, wayfinding throughout similar things. Uh, minor compliance issues traditionally are covered either through our minor um, capital improvement funding or our operating funds. E examples of minor issues include things like replacing grab bars, um, installing uh, appropriate signage, changing outdoor hardware, things like that. M more complex um, items that are noted uh, do take more to do. I, a lot of times that'll take design and engineering um, and a, a contractor through a ca capital construction project to do that work. Examples of that would be like a brand new building entrance or completely remodeling a restroom. Um, anything. Excuse me. Anything urgent and um, unfunded and complex uh, issues are the focus of this um, funding source um, and will help us in, uh, accommodate those items and take care of them. And it is important to note that there are times that um, full ADA compliance is not uh, achievable due to things such as structural issues or historic preservation considerations. With that, I'll turn the meeting over to Adam. Um, Chair James, uh, at this time, staff is available to answer any questions about the uh, previously presented projects, the additional information you've heard here today, and anything that uh, caught your eye uh, with in, in the memo and attachments that were circulated yesterday. We're, we're happy to answer any questions. Okay, Mr. Chair. Yes, Ms. George. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I mentioned something that... Ms. Hamilton, you said the library serve um, meals to children. What can you tell me about that? Oh, I can tell you that um, it's a very popular program, committee member George, and um, 
This is provided through a partnership with the um, food bank and we serve meals to children after school and um, we also provide an educational activity with that. So it, we have it in many locations and um, it's a very, very popular program. That was, thank you. That was the second part of my question. Is that in all 17 libraries? Not all 17, um, mostly it's in um, six libraries, so. Thank you. So I'm thinking this is the right time to ask this question. So there was public comment last time um, <coughs> that I believe said um, that was very supportive of the library, but that the concern was expanding by two libraries would then um, not have the investment in the current libraries. So I guess what I'm wanting to know is um, if there are two new libraries built based on the ongoing operations, how will that impact the hours and the services of the current libraries? As, as you know, um, I'm bragging again about Harmon Branch Library, which is a lifesaver for our community. And when the hours were cut, it was a dramatic uh, impact for our residents who use it every day. So it, how will that work out? Am I asking, do you understand what I'm asking? <laughs> Yes, committee member Olivas, I do I understand. We um, do not anticipate any changes to ours by adding these locations, and we're very um, firm that that will, that will be funded. So there's no um, taking from the operations of the existing libraries. This is all <coughs> new capital money and then the operating costs will be budgeted by the city as well. So there won't be any negative effect to the current service. Okay, and Lee, can I have one more question? Yes, Ms. Olivas. Uh, so my next question is then, um, uh, will that impact any of the capital improvements for the existing libraries that we have now? I would like to refer to. <laughs> Subcommittee uh, member Olivas and uh, the rest of the committee know. Um, there has been a needs assessments done for the existing facilities. There's no numbers for that and we were continuing to work with the library staff and city leadership on funding resources to address those needs as they um, occur. Okay, so I just wanna make sure I'm hearing right though. You're saying that none of the current libraries would be impacted if we added one or two libraries that that in general, the gen uh, operating hours would not be reduced because the operations would not be impacted at all. And then we would have service in two locations to some very far areas of town. Is that right? That's correct. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I don't know if Ms. Peters or Mr. Stevenson, whoever would be appropriate for this. Um, we're talking obviously about ranking all these things, which typically in my mind means we're cutting some things. Um, so uh, I haven't done the math yet, but I'm trying to figure out how far over the $500 million number are we for the whole package? And so how much should we be thinking about in terms of requests and so forth? Do we have a sense of that yet? Or, and if we don't, I understand, but, but do, we, do we have an idea? What percent are we expected to sort of cut? Thank from you, our Mr. Chair, Mr. Klotzi. Um, I think that the, the task of this subcommittee is really to provide the ranking. And um, Adam Miller will speak in a little bit about how we can best support that effort from the subcommittee. Um, as to, I think at the outset, we did hear some figures about how much, how much over the 500 million we are in the aggregate. Um, and I would defer to, to Adam to reiterate those if he has those. Uh, All right, I know it's not a fun question, but we're gonna have to cut to the chase at some point, so. Subcommittee member Clocky, Mr. Chairman, members of the subcommittee, yes, thanks for the question. Uh, there, there was about $650 million included in the prioritized capital needs portion of the capital needs study. As the addendum, the the needs that were identified for future needs brought that total up to about 1.2 billion. Uh, since subcommittees have begun deliberating and meeting, uh, we have had additional uh, 
recommendations uh, put forward by the public. And so where that number stands today is, is hard to say, but, but it, the prioritized needs that you received was 650 million. Okay. So everything on this list is part of that prioritized need then for this subcommittee, I'm assuming. The, 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 the handout that was here is part of that number. Sorry, yeah, put you on the spot there. I, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Faku, which, which handout are you referring to? Uh, I'm sorry, to? The, the listing with all the different projects on it um, for this sub, in particular this subcommittee. So that identifies the prioritized needs as well as future needs. And so okay. what Adam is referring to is the sum of the prioritized needs. Okay, all right, thank you. Thank yes, you. Ms. Ross. Um, I had a question regarding something brought up during public comment last time as well. The Phoenix Theater Company presented about um, missing a deadline by one day. Is it possible to add this also to, for consideration on a prioritized need, um, being that what they're requesting is to make their building more ADA accessible? My understanding is this is a City of Phoenix building. So it, would we need to make, a, is this something we can consider? Chairman James uh, and uh, commission members, the, this committee uh, has before it only a, an ADA program. So uh, there are not specific projects uh, that would, would get funded as part of a, an, an ADA effort. Um, what uh, Mr. Yule walked us through is the, the process the city's going uh, forward to evaluate all of the, the buildings the city owns from an ADA perspective with an expert that is making recommendations that will then be used to prioritize which projects uh, will get funding if it's allotted as part of the, the GEO bond program in the future. And so uh, if there is a desire to try and ensure a specific project uh, is, is considered, that would have to be through the arts and culture subcommittee to uh, ensure that that one could, could be funded and considered on a project by project basis because that's what, what they are evaluating versus the overall allotment that the city's asking to cover all of the, the buildings that the city owns and the substantial needs that are there to address ADA issues. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so uh, I don't have any questions about what was presented today, but Ms. Peters, you said, did anything catch our eye in the, in the circulated memo? And, and um, one of the things that caught my eye was uh, that the heritage and, and Orpheum run at a loss. Um, and one of the questions that we had last time was uh, whether or not we'd done any sort of evaluation about uh, whether uh, the market rate, whether they, they were at market rate or below market rate. Um, and I didn't see that necessarily answered, but I did see that they run at a loss. And so I was wondering if there have been any studies on uh, whether or not rates for those, those uh, areas could be raised and, and still um, uh, satisfy the, the need. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Osorin. Uh, we do have uh, Mr. Chan here with us today, the author of the memo, um, and I will be happy to defer to him on that question, uh, which is specific to have we done a study of our rental and ticket prices such that we could uh, potentially use some of those revenues for these capital improvement purposes. And so what he's provided in the memo is a five-year operating and capital summary but uh, nothing specific to the study of those that, that you've asked about. So I, I'm, I'm sorry, the, specifically the, the question was about the engineering study? No, it was about market rate of what we charge for use of the facilities at Heritage and Orpheum. At, at, for the Orpheum specifically, we do have published rates uh, for um, the use of the rental of the facility, which is uh, adopted per city council ordinance. And of course that those, that there's, that's the base rent. There's also, you know, additional costs that charges 
for ticketing fees, facility fees, uh, use of uh, production costs and labor equipment, and things like that. Yeah, I, I guess my question was noticing that those both run at a loss, uh, whether there was uh, anything uh, that had been analyzed to say w whether or not um, we're charging below market rates for those properties and therefore we could actually not only operate those in positive income but but also cover some of the capital expenditures necessary uh, if we, we charged a, a going market rate. Um, that That's a great question. The, uh, one of the things that the staff is currently reviewing is the city's rate ordinance for our facilities. So we're constantly reviewing how the the venue compares in the market not only on the rental rate but for you know additional services provided so we're we're looking at those and and we'll be uh, hopefully making recommendations in the future uh, coming up to the city council on a, on a amended rate ordinance thank you yes miss george thank you mr chairman um since we're in public works now but I'd like to segue a bit back to libraries. Of the 17 libraries, and we can take out Burton Bar, but of the 16 other libraries, has there been any studies of the maintenance needs on the other 16 libraries? Yes, uh, committee member George and members of the subcommittee, yes, there have been facility condition assessments completed at all the other libraries. And we have that information and we're working closely with our partners in the library department to address those needs. Will it be available to this committee? In terms subcommittee? Of the, the results of the facility condition assessments? Yes. I Mr. believe Chair. so. Yes, uh, uh, Member George, if, if that would be of interest to the subcommittee, we can, we can provide the facility. It's of interest assessments. to me. Thank you. <laughs> yes, Ms. Olivas. I wanted to go back to the ADA. So my understanding is that you are requesting a amount in here that you've prioritized um, and that oh, if that were to be um, agreed upon by this committee, then you would take this portfolio you have and then prioritize those. And so obviously there are gonna be some things that are not done. Uh, and so my question is, how are they not done if we're required to do them through ADA com uh, compliance requirements? So, I mean, I I'm a little unclear how one, I, I guess I'm a little saddened that we are in a position of being in non-compliance, uh, um, but if we are to get some funding in here in order, which uh, you know, is, uh, we should, in order to get into compliance, but there's still gonna be things that are not done because this, this is not a complete list. So how are the other things gonna be handled if you got some funding from the bond? So th that'll be informed greatly by the ADA transition plan that is, as I mentioned, is currently in development. Those, those assessments were started last year and will continue on. The, the highest priority items, you know, related to maybe like access into the building or being able to utilize the facility, those will most likely rise to the top and those will be the items that, you know, we would mostly consider for this funding and then other, um, things that are not able to be done with this bond program, we'll, we'll be working with our partners in our operating divisions and city leadership to, to identify funding. It, and that's part of why it's called a transition plan. You're not expected to get everything done you know, right away, um, but you wanna try to take care of those most urgent things first and continue to plan for funding to take care of all of the items. Yeah, and, and I do recall last meeting where um, um, Mr. Stevenson did tell us that there could possibly be on, because I asked the question, does that mean we're gonna get current and then there's no more addition for the next bond? Um, and he did, I remember, say that there could potentially be some ongoing things as regulations change, that kind of stuff. So I understand that, so Correct. thank you. You're welcome. And, and Chairman James uh, and uh, Member Levis, if I can just add that part of uh, what the city is seeking to address is 
uh, in the 2,000 or so buildings that the city owns, they were a uh, number of them built prior to the current ADA standards. And so uh, that's why we are having to go back and update those, those ones. And so a big portion of this is addressing things that you know were, were built to the ADA standards at the time, but as those standards evolved, uh, then you have to go back and retrofit things. And, and that's really what, what that is about in a lot of those instances. And so since we haven't had a, a bond election since 2006, and ADA was most uh, update, recently updated, I think in 2010, that's where you're seeing a lot of the, the need from some of this uh, come forward. So my understanding is that city facilities should be retrofitted um, if you're gonna have them occupied and used for the public. So they should have already been retrofitted at the time the city decided to operate them. Um, so how are we going back I understand that some of these buildings are very old but again you know so I'm just trying to look at all the pieces <laughs> uh, and chairman James and uh, member Olivas that's why the city's hired a, an ADA expert to help us study and prioritize those and uh, and where you just heard mr. you will say that likely um, things that we get prioritized are access uh, updates and those kinds of, of things uh, to make sure that we are uh, doing everything we can to uh, for those areas that the public is accessing to make them accessible for all of our, our all of our citizens. Thank you. Okay. Are there any other questions? Yes. Uh, yes, I'd like to segue back to the Ortham Theater, uh, a query regarding, you know, the outlay of the budget was nice. Um, I'm assuming others part of the market sales. And uh, unfortunately, we have to squeeze things and cut somewhere. And unique about the Ortham Theater and the historic preservation uh, district is that you have revenue, correct? And so has there been any, and I, I run businesses, and so you always wanna project in the future what your market is. And so has there been an evaluation study done, let's say for three years out, we have a five year a go bond period that we know that downtown Phoenix is expanding in population, the density of population will increase, that demographic group will be higher income earning. So the projections in the next you know, few years, five years, should be a higher revenue stream coming into those uh, facilities. Has there been uh, you know, an assessment? Has that been conducted? Uh, again, looking at what the forthcoming market is. Um, the in, in terms of future revenues, a lot of that would be dependent upon, you know, uh, business, number of performances, number of, uh, you know, tickets sold and revenues. So that is forecast um, out into the future. Um, I, I don't have my, at my fingertips how that would look from a uh, profit and loss standpoint, um, but I will tell you that um, you know, as, as you saw in, in the uh, in the staff report on the on the five year uh, expenses, the uh, pandemic significantly impacted the revenue stream of the theaters as well as every other uh, you know public venue uh, around the country, uh, and so that we're, we're just now getting back to the, those pre pandemic levels. So we'll have to kind of reassess moving forward uh, how. Um, the revenue streams look. All right, thank you. I think just having some type of forecast would be helpful in, in judging, you know, what, what that cost would be. Okay. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Clapper. A uh, quick question. Uh, I noticed um, that some of the funding for the new libraries comes from impact fees. Are those fees locked into that district? So if it wasn't funded this time around, that they would remain there to build something in the future? Or are those, do those move around um, if they're not used? Mr. Chairman and uh, Member Clocky, the impact fees are specific to those geographic areas of the city. Yes, Ms. Olivas. Yes, I think I only wanted to make a comment about the Orpheum, which is a 
one of the greatest historic sites in downtown, um, and that it has also been one of the most affordable, which has also made downtown inclusive to many, many groups. So um, I, I'm always concerned when we're talking about raising fees to a point that uh, not um, that limits accessibility to the downtown area. As you know, nobody can afford to live downtown anymore. Uh, but that's just my comment. So I do understand the need for it to be profitable, um, but it should be balanced with the need to be accessible. Okay. Any other comments from our subcommittee members? Okay. Uh, we will now move to the uh, public comment period of our agenda. Um, will the city attorney please explain the rules of public comment in our GO bond committee meetings? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Members of the public may speak to comment on general obligation bond program. The city code requires speakers to present their comments in a respectful and courteous manner. Profane language, threats, or personal attacks on members of the public, council members, committee members, or staff are not allowed. A person who violates these rules will lose the opportunity to continue to speak. The committee and staff cannot discuss or comment on matters related to pending claims or litigation. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. We have eight speakers registered today, including one virtual participant wishing to speak. I will give each speaker two minutes. We will start with the virtual participant. When your name is called, your audio device will be unmuted and you must begin your remarks. At the conclusion of this virtual speaker, we will invite in-person attendees to the podium to address the committee. Will staff please call our first speaker. Our first speaker is Ann Bommersbach, followed by Layla Alston in the upper council chambers. Ann, are you on the line? Yes, I am. Thank you, you may proceed. Thank you. Uh, yes, my name is Ann Bommersbach. I live in uh, Willow Historic District. Um, I just have a couple of comments or maybe questions. Um, you know, I sort of briefly looked at the entire package, and in my mind, you know, we should always be addressing the um, deferred maintenance and repairs items first before we look at the new projects and new builds, because associated with those, you know, we're going to have more ongoing costs, uh, operating costs, maintenance, and all of that. So what I quickly did was I sort of pulled out any of the new builds, new projects from the prioritized list. And I was left with over $400 million just in satisfying the other, the other needs. So I, I guess my question is, does, does the city have any breakdown by uh, subcommittee, uh, which shows items uh, first, uh, with um, you know deferred maintenance costs, and then maybe a, maybe another column for new projects, new builds, so we could kind of get an idea of you know total maintenance costs, which I believe we should take care of first. Um, so that that's one question. Um, the other thing is with respect to libraries in particular, um, I think they're all important, and we should do whatever we can. Uh, to you know, maintain our libraries. But again, I think we need to maintain what we have before we look at new ones. Um, and I would say though, for the, for the expansions, the Yucca branch would be one that would be very important for those areas that are more economically depressed maybe. And I, I believe that might uh, apply to the Yucca branch. Um, we, sh we should look at those first before looking at maybe the Desert Ridge area that library up there because number one, there are three libraries that are fairly close to that. And that is not a disadvantaged area. I believe these uh, people could. Thank you, uh, thank you. Your, your time has run up. Run okay, up. Th thank, okay, thank you. All right, thank you very much. 
Our next speaker is Senator Leila Alston in the Upper Council Chambers, followed by Chuck Levinas. Senator Alston. Yes. Here we go. Okay. Okay, we'll start over. Thank you very much. My name is Leela Alston, and I have the honor and the pleasure of representing Legislative District 5 uh, in the state legislature um, in the state senate. Uh, the Phoenix Theater has been a part of my life since I was a child. I grew up uh, in the near neighborhood and currently live in the near neighborhood. So all of my childhood, my teen years, uh, and most of my adult years have, have been uh, in and around the neighborhoods uh, that enjoy uh, the Phoenix Theater and the Public Library. Uh, this afternoon I'm here to ask that you consider uh, adding to the list uh, the Phoenix Theater uh, for the purpose of compliance with the um, Americans with Disabilities Act, uh, the city engineers have looked at the current building and have uh, deemed that it is not fixable, uh, that it needs to be a new structure uh, on the near site. So we're not talking about uh, land costs, but uh, a new building so that people with disabilities uh, can come and enjoy uh, the, the theater and participate. You'll hear from one of the employees uh, of the facility uh, a little later and his struggles, He's Mr. Matt Shaver, has been with the theater for 16 years and cannot even reach all the parts of the building uh, that he needs to reach to work with his employees. So please uh, consider putting the Phoenix Theater Project on the list. I understand it is not on the list but one of you or the group of you, I don't know exactly how that works uh, politically or process-wise. Thank you. <laughs> ask that you put that on the list uh, for consideration for the bond. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure being with you today. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Chuck Levinas, followed by Michael Barnard in the Upper Council Chambers. Good afternoon, my name is Chuck Levinas. Um, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, I would like to request to yield my time to Representative Longdon. Um, she's gonna be speaking about the same project and she's far more articulate than I can ever be. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Michael Barnard, followed by Representative Jennifer Longdon. Good afternoon, and thank you for having me here. Um, I truly appreciate it. My name is Michael Barnard, and I'm the producing artistic director for the Phoenix Theater Company. Um, and um, we are here to humbly request uh, funding for uh, bringing our backstage areas um, into ADA compliancy. Um, we have been able, we are 103 years old, uh, we serve about 150,000 patrons a year and <clears throat> somewhere between 15,000 artists. 
Um, but we are not inclusive when it comes to um, mobily challenged uh, individuals or people who have reached an age or have a, an ailment of some sort that cannot um, go up and down um, stairs and the likes of that. Um, this, as you heard, the city engineer has already taken a look at our building and they cannot fix it um, efficiently. They say that we need to have a new, new build in order to come into compliance. We um, have artists, designers, orchestra members, crews, uh, and staff that <coughs> all could use um, this ADA compliance. We've been patchworking um, our way through accessibility um, in, the, in the backstage backstage areas for years. Um, again, however, we have uh, been able to be compliant through front of house, so our patrons are um, taken care of in all the public spaces. It is primarily our backstage uh, um, areas, dressing rooms, uh, rehearsal halls, offices, studios, the likes of that. And so I appreciate so much your consideration of um, this request, funding request. Um, Thank you so much. Thank you. Our next speaker is Representative Longden, followed by Matthew Schaefer. Good afternoon. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and members. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. I'm Jennifer Longden. I'm state representative representing currently Legislative District 24, which is Central Phoenix and South Scottsdale, and the new LD5 in the future. I serve with Senator Alston. And I, too, am here with regard to the Phoenix Theater Project. First, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, I was here this morning and testified before the Arts and Culture Subcommittee and I've heard, um, I've, I've heard these committees do this. Um, this morning, the Arts Committee was told that their funding for this project would come from this bucket, and this afternoon I'm hearing that it needs to come out of that bucket. So I'm begging you, as you consider this project, that you work with the other chairs or however that goes, to make sure that this particular project doesn't fall through the cracks. I'd like to tell you why it's so important. Um, the Americans with Disabilities Act is much more than a building code. It's a declaration of human rights. It says that people with disabilities have a right to exist in our public spaces. Arts are about imagination. Arts are about imagining the world as we want it to be. And that's where these two projects come together. The Phoenix Theater Company was built before we as a community recognized that people with disabilities were entitled to a public life. And so it doesn't exist within that building, which means that we lose the imagination and the human potential of the folks who are effectively barred from participation within that building. The managing director has functioned inside that building for 16 years and has never been able to attend the performance hall where the magic happens. Young people who want to attend performance camps, if they too live with a disability, are effectively barred from participating. How can they imagine a future where they may be part of the performing arts, where they may experience that transformation if we say everyone is welcome in this space but you? We're better than that. We need to ensure that this project gets funded. It is part of the ethos of the city. We are open to everyone. I have sat in these chambers and worked on civil rights issues for every group in our community, and we need to ensure that this project gets done. There are amazing transformative uh, performing troops that are disability forward who could not come here and present their art to us because we can't welcome them. There are Tony Award winning actresses who use wheelchairs who could not perform. Think about all the performers that you know. Uh, someone like Itzhak Perlman could not go in to the rehearsal halls at the Phoenix Theater Company. 
which means we are borrowing composers and directors and writers and musicians and artists of every type from using this premier facility here in our city. And we are better than that. So I beg you, please, do not let this project fall through the cracks because art says it belongs to ADA and ADA says it belongs to the arts because this belongs to Phoenix. I want to remind you that if every person, every Phoenix resident who used a wheelchair converged in one spot at one time, we would fill our sports stadiums to capacity twice. Where are we? You don't see us in public life because we make it too difficult for those things to happen. So, thank Mr. Chair, I appreciate your indulgence and thank you for hearing me. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Matthew Schaefer, followed by Cindy Gogan. Hi there. I, I'm up here, guys. Um, I, I won't take up too much more of your time. I'm here to speak on behalf of the Phoenix Theater Project as well. Uh, Representative Longden has said it everything I could say much better than I could say it. <laughs> um, um, but I, I am the managing director of the theater that she mentioned. I have gone to work every day for 16 years and persevered. And um, But this isn't about me. This is about the students in summer camps. This is about the uh, actors who can't get into the rehearsal hall. This is about the um, musicians who can't be in our orchestras because our, our orchestra room is upstairs. There are so many people that this affects. Um, makes me a little uncomfortable to be in the spotlight. I'm representing all of those people. Um, thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Our next speaker is Cindy Gogan, followed by Sandra Bassett. Thank you for um, following up, Matthew, after um, Representative Longden. I'm glad I didn't have to be on her coattails to, to address. <laughs> Um, good afternoon, Mr. Chair and members of the subcommittee. For the record, my name is Cindy Gon, and I'm here as the Senior Director of Phoenix Community Alliance. I'm speaking on behalf of our members and our Board of Directors. For background, Phoenix Community Alliance is the 39-year-old business and community leadership organization working to build a better downtown for a greater Phoenix. Our members include for-profit and non-profit organizations of all sizes, small and large retail organizations, private professionals, neighborhood associations, and students. Our central city planning and development and our arts, culture, and public life committees support advocacy for historic preservation. Thank you for the opportunity to advocate before you today for your volunteering, for your service on this committee, for bringing your understanding and expertise to this work, and for the vital role you play in supporting neighborhoods and city services. Phoenix's stock of historic properties is dwindling at an alarming rate. Properties cannot be added to the historic property register and historic property overlays cannot be applied quickly enough. Buildings we once treasured that added texture and a sense of the people and events that came before us are gone. And more are joining the growing queue every month because of ongoing deterioration and as more applications for demolition permits are submitted. Phoenix Community Alliance advocates for the full funding for the following historic preservation projects. Historic preservation demonstra demonstration project grants. Historic preservation exterior rehabilitation grant program. Historic preservation warehouse and threatened building program. The Orpheum Theater exterior restoration the Dupa Adobe restoration. And we also ask that this project be reclassified to be the prioritized needs, as well as the to Tovria Castle. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you. Our final speaker is Sandra Bassett. Good afternoon. My name is Sandra Bassett. I am the CEO for the Phoenix Center for the Arts. I thank you for the opportunity to be here today to advocate on behalf of that organization. The Phoenix Center for the Arts has been an arts and cultural resource for the greater Phoenix community for over 45 years. We consist of two historic buildings. We have 14 art studios, eight rooms for community events, and a 210-seat theater. 
Each year, the Phoenix Center for the Arts connects and engages our diverse community through access to performing and visual arts for over 35,000 visitors, offering art classes to over 2,500 students in over 200 zip codes from 60 cities, 16 states, and two countries via our online and in-person activities. We provide financial opportunities to over 50 local artists to teach classes, schools, and outreach programs. We are the home to eight nonprofit organizations, and we host well over 150 events annually in our theater. Imagine you're driving on the I-10 and you exit at 3rd Street from the HOV lane. You're entering into the revitalized downtown area. You look ahead and you wonder, what is that? Or you're driving from Midtown into 3rd Street, on 3rd Street, and you look to the entrance of Margaret T. Hans Park and you again wonder, what is this? What you're seeing was the first Southern Baptist Church established in 1921, with the church being constructed in 1931. It is now the Third Street Theater and part of what is the Phoenix Center for the Arts and includes the Third Street Theater, the attached main office, our visual arts building, and the adjacent now vacant former sanctuary known as the North Building. I'm here to ask for your assistance in preserving this history as these historically designated buildings are in vital need of repair and restoration and has been deferred in this repair and restoration for many years. I am happy to email any supporting documentation and I ask that you help us to become of the revitalization and not part of the despair that you may see when you look at our buildings downtown. Thank you so much for your time and Thank your you. consideration. Thank you very much. Chair James, that was our final speaker. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, this concludes our public comment period. Uh, thanks to all who participated. I will open the meeting to subcommittee members for comments and discussions. Yes, Ms. Rouse. Uh, I do wanna ask again, uh, after hearing public comment on Phoenix Theater Company, can the Phoenix Theater Company um, be considered as part of the part of the ten point one million dollar uh, city facility ADA improvements? So, uh, Chairman James, uh, Member uh, Rouse, uh, let me clarify in my comments from before. So, this subcommittee only has a a ten million dollar program before it. There are not specific projects that can be called out. However, uh, the Phoenix uh, Theater proposal could be included as part of the 10 million, but there's no guarantee that it would get funded uh, in the future as part of that 10 million, because again, that's competing against all the other city buildings that are going through an ADA assessment by an expert with recommendations of what to prioritize that spending in the future. So I, I wanna be very clear as, as this committee is deliberating this, as well as, as arts and culture and, and for the folks who are asking for it that if it is in here, there's no guarantee that it, it's getting funded as part of that 10 million. Um, and, but it's certainly eligible to be included. Any other uh, comments? Yes, Mr. Clocky. Uh, I noticed in one of the handouts for um, the, the Phoenix Theater Company it was a number of $6 million. Is that a contractor's number? Or is that just the, and maybe someone from that organization could answer that. that. Is that like an actual contractor's bid? I think the gentleman in the back might be able to answer that. Chairman James, if you'd like to bring forward a representative to answer that question. Absolutely. Oh. The the, the number that's being quoted is um, a combination of our, a contractor that we engaged as well as city engineers. Any other questions or comments? Yes, Ms. George. There was an older handout, I think from a, a fellow commissioner handed it to me from last time that was passed out to by one of the speakers and it said six million dollars on sure it. I have it in the files thank you 
Any other comments or discussions from the subcommittee? As a reminder, our task will be to develop a ranking ordered list of project priorities for the executive committee. Staff have indicated that can assist the subcommittee with facilitating the subcommittee discussions going forward. I will turn the meeting over to the staff to discuss that process. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the subcommittee. As the chairman just mentioned, the subcommittee is tasked with uh, developing a recommendation to the executive committee that is comprised of a rank ordered list of projects that in your opinion cannot be or should not be deferred to a future bond program. I want to emphasize that the subcommittee's recommendation does not mark the end of this process or the final opportunity for the public to weigh in. The, the, uh, subcommittee has two more meetings that will include uh, public comment. Uh, the executive committee uh, will be meeting and uh, there will be opportunities for the public to weigh in during those discussions as well as during council meetings uh, later this year. The subcommittee has two meetings after today to develop and finalize your recommendation. The basic question at hand is how will you go about identifying the list of projects that will be considered and how we go about ultimately ranking those projects by priority. Additionally, the subcommittee has been asked to recommend funding levels for each project and identify, again, in your opinion, which projects cannot reasonably be deferred to, to a future bond program. Ultimately, your method of developing recommendations for the executive committee is at the full discretion of the subcommittee. However, if it's desired and directed by the subcommittee, staff is prepared to support the process by distributing a survey tool for members to complete independent rankings. The survey will include the list of projects identified by the subcommittee, allow members to rank those projects, allow for members to identify if a particular project should be funded at a higher or lower level. The survey is a web-based application that would be distributed and completed between subcommittee meetings. Staff will provide a presentation summarizing the combined results at the following meeting. Members will have the opportunity to discuss your choices and rationale, but individual rankings will not be included in the staff's presentation. Survey results are not binding. The intent of this is uh, that the outcome would be a starting point for subcommittee deliberations, a catalyst for those deliberations to begin. Again, the decision to use the tool is entirely at the discretion and direction of the subcommittee. If this is something that the subcommittee would like to consider, then the next major undertaking is to solidify the list of projects uh, so that the survey can be prepared. The list of projects must be identified no later than the end of your next meeting, the third meeting, so that we can then come back at your uh, final meeting uh, to present results and have the subcommittee uh, deliberate on your final recommendation to executive committee. Any questions on the survey tool? Are there any questions? Okay. Uh, this would be an optional process for the subcommittee. Um, do any members have any comments on the facilitated process being utilized as a basis for our next meeting to them discuss and finalize an agenda item in a future meeting? Yes, Ms. Dodd. Um, it sounds like it's a daunting task, and I think this survey tool would really be very helpful um, to help us get to a starting point for discussion. So um, I would be very supportive of using this survey tool. Chairman, I also would be um, uh, supportive of using this tool. I know that the recommendation was 
the meeting after the next one? Uh, why not the third meeting? Why can't we do that now? Um, I don't, it, it appears that we have a, a pretty decent list. Haven't heard any new public comment uh, either. Mr. Chairman, subcommittee, OSRN, members of the subcommittee, certainly if the subcommittee is prepared uh, to identify what that list of projects is that you would like to then go forward with ranking, uh, we could pull that together at the conclusion, you know, following this meeting, have the presentation prepared for your third meeting and move forward from there. Any other comments or questions? Yes, Ms. George. Mr. Chairman, um, I think it should be uh, prepared as soon as the city can have it prepared for us. Well, I believe this is a, a good place for us to start, so. Um, okay, great. Um, based on today's uh, discussion, uh, do any subcommittee members have any requests for the next meeting agenda? Okay. Yes, Ms. Dahl. Thank you, just um, a question. So this list in which to use for the survey um, I assume that based on what um, staff has suggested, we would either, we could add to that based on comments we've heard, or we could even take away, or maybe um, partially fund. I, I, I'm just wondering about this list in which we start so for this survey. Chairman James uh, and Member Dodds, that, that's a, a great question. and. Adam will, will walk us uh, through as part of uh, uh, the presentation. We can go back over the prioritized list because we, you can't add a, and expand a program or do anything else to that. Yeah, that. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, subcommittee member yes. Dodds. Did you want to do that now? Yeah, yeah, let's do it right now. Okay, uh, members of the That's subcommittee. So, uh, uh, yes, Ms. Olivas. Yes, I have a question. So um, that would mean that today, if you're saying that we're going to now go through a survey based on this prioritized list, um, then the next meeting we're going to review that list and I guess prepare it. That would imply that today was the last day for public comment. Mr. Chairman, subcommittee member Olivas, members of the subcommittee, uh, it, it would uh, allow the subcommittee to move forward with an initial ranking. Uh, it would be at the subcommittee's discretion as well as the executive committee's discretion as to whether or not additional outside proposals uh, should be considered as the program moves forward. So, so I guess my question is, how was the community informed that this would be their last public comment night? But it, it wouldn't preclude us from adding more. It's just to facilitate the discussion, right? So, so we would go through, prioritize this list, and make recommendations based on this list, but if someone came to another, one of the other two meetings that we have, then how uh, we have the ability to incorporate that into this list if we thought as a committee it should be there. Is that what you're saying? Subcommittee member Olivas, members of the subcommittee, uh, that discussion would take place as you're formulating your recommendation. Again, the results of the survey would in no way be binding. The results of the survey would be informative to uh, act as a catalyst uh, to start the deliberation of what your recommendation looks like. If another proposal comes in between the time that you've taken the survey and the subcommittee uh, believes that that should be part of the final recommendation, you certainly would have you know, the, yeah. the option to include it. Yeah, I understand. So, I mean, that makes sense for us to look at this and prioritize this, because I mean, there may be some things on here that we just all agree should not be on this altogether. Um, my only concern is uh, how is the public uh, informed of when they could make public comment that actually mattered, if it's just to make public comment, because it's just on the agenda, uh, but if it's to make public comment so they can have input um, uh, then I just want to make sure we don't take away that moment for them. So I don't know what the information was that went out or was publicized. Does that make sense? Okay. 
Yes, uh, uh, Chair James, Member Olivas, I, I think uh, what we ought to do is go through the prioritized list that we have. Um, I would just say that to the extent that there are additional projects that the subcommittee wants to consider, you, you should direct staff to do the analysis necessary for us to understand the costs and any associated operating costs. We, we do need to do a little bit of work um, in order for it to go forward to the executive committee, but there's time absolutely to do that. So uh, what, I, what I, I think would be helpful is if we could go through the list of what has been discussed and then you can, we can discuss that some more and, and determine next steps. Yeah, and I'm sorry, I just don't feel like I'm getting an answer. How was the public informed? What, was, what did we, t we, the city, tell them the meetings, the subcommittee meeting purpose was? So were they informed that they could come at all of these and be, give co public comment and that we should consider those? Do you understand what I'm saying? I, I don't know what well, they were informed. Chair James, uh, Member Olivas, yes, the, the members of the community are invited to all of the subcommittee meetings. They're invited to come to the executive committee meetings and public comment will be allowed at all of those meetings. Uh, the, the one comment that I would add to that is there has been discussion uh, with the public that in order for the subcommittee to consider this million dollar estimate for Phoenix Theater is because Phoenix Theater was told when they showed up arts and culture we can have some basic information in which to to give the subcommittee and since okay. you only have four meetings to make that recommendation we would need to have anybody wishing to propose anything else by this next meeting the, the third one because otherwise you, you might get something and we won't be able to tell you is their cost in the ballpark is it even eligible we won't know if they're showing up on that fourth meeting. And so there is public comment allowed on the agenda, but if it wants to be considered as part of your recommendation that has to happen in that four meetings, it, we have to have it by the, the third meeting for a project to be considered. And there is information that we can give to someone if they wish to have it considered that they can then fill out from there. Okay. Thank you. Any other comments? Or questions? Yes, Ms. George. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, this would probably be for Mr. Stevenson or maybe Public Works, I'm not sure. It was my understanding that uh, the Phoenix Theater submitted it, but their submission was one day late. Is that correct? Mr. Chair, uh, Member George, uh, I believe this was actually discussed at some length this morning at the Arts and Culture Subcommittee. Um, I certainly have heard the same information, but I couldn't confirm that. Uh, Ms. Ms. I didn't George. hear the last part, please, Ms. Peters. Uh, uh, Ms. George, um, I think Ms. Peters was saying that we have heard the same information that it was submitted uh, a day late um, and that we could have, uh, I think Ms. Erickson is here, uh, who represents the, uh, the city manager's office at the uh, Arts and Culture Subcommittee. And as part of that discussion earlier today, we understand that that subcommittee did ask staff to include that as a, as a prioritized project for them to evaluate. Um, but we'll let uh, Ms. Erickson go through some of the details on that. Uh, Chairman James and uh, uh, member George, um, th th I think the day late really wasn't an issue. I think they had been evaluating it, but the engineers didn't get the report back until that later date. So we were always had it as a, an item that was on the list of arts and culture, but the actual funding need and the actual evaluation didn't happen until after the projects had already been submitted. The arts and culture group had already identified it as a, a need but it didn't make that original list. It was on the future list. Does that make sense? Thank you. We have a future list like 24, 25. Is that the thing that we have? Or it won't even be considered for this bond election? I, I think that's, again, uh, at the pleasure of the various subcommittees. Thank you. Any other questions or comments from the subcommittee members? 
Yes, Mr. Clarkey. Um, one of the things that came up at the last meeting was the, the say if I'm saying this wrong, Vice Chair, the DUPA Adobe uh, building. I think there's been some research done on that, but it's not on this list. I just wanted to bring that forward. It was a relatively lower cost project as projects go. I think it was under $200,000. Um, so if, if that um, could potentially be part of the mix as we do this, that would be wonderful. If not, and if it has to be later on, that's fine too. Uh, Chairman James uh, and Commissioner Clocky, that would have to be something that the the committee would direct that to be moved up to be considered as part of the prioritized list in terms of the the survey ranking that we would then send out. So if, if enough of the members wish to do that, we can certainly do that. We just would need that direction from you all. Any other comments or questions from the subcommittee members? Yes, sir. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, Subcommittee Member uh, Ruth uh, discussed earlier uh, the question about whether the um, Phoenix Theater could be included within the uh, ADA proposal for the $10 million ADA proposal uh, for the, the city. Um, and, you know, uh, I think the answer that you gave was it could be, um, but it might not be. Uh, it's really an overall grant. Uh, can a recommendation like that be earmarked within uh, the approval process uh, for the ADA grant, or, or is that not possible? Chairman James uh, and uh, committee members, that is something that because we are getting a, a report from an ADA expert on all of the various city buildings, I don't believe it would be appropriate for uh, a, a recommendation of, of outranking other ones based upon some type of, uh, you know, of an ADA principle uh, in terms of what are those most uh, impacts to the overall public. We can certainly explore that and come back as part of the, the next meeting, but uh, to make sure on that. But the way it's been set up is those that uh, are getting a priority ranking to get funding are going to be those that have the most significant impacts to the public as a whole. And because we're talking about $6 million of, of the $10 million, I, I want to be very, you know, clear that we will try and look at that. But at the, at the same time, if there are other funding, you know, needs that outrank it from a, a, an ADA perspective in terms of impacts to the public, those are, are going to get funded more than, than one that's earmarked through a public process. Okay. Any other comments or questions? Okay. All right. We'll move forward. I want uh, GO Bond Executive Committee on Wednesday, September 14th at 6 p.m. This will be a hybrid meeting, so residents will be able to participate virtually or in person. More important more information is available at www.phoenix.gov slash bond. Mr. James, uh, Chair James, uh, before we wrap up, I definitely want to respond to the committee's interest in hearing the whole list. Okay. Um, and Adam is prepared to go through that right now. Uh, before, yeah, absolutely. Before we wrap up. Okay. Yes, Mr. Miller. Thank you, Deputy City Manager Peters. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the subcommittee. I will go over the prioritized uh, needs list. There are three library projects in that list. There is a branch library, a new branch library at d the Desert View Civic Space, in Desert View Village. There is a new branch library at Estrella Civic Space in Estrella Village. There is an expansion to the Yucca Branch Library at 15th Avenue, 5648 North 15th Avenue. There are three, oh, sorry, I didn't realize I had the slides right in front of me. There are three public works facilities uh, programs included in the prioritized needs. Those are the city facility ADA compliance improvements at 10.1 million, the city service center property improvements at 10.1 million, and the downtown city property improvements, again, at 10.1 million. And then rounding that out, 
with the historic uh, historic uh, preservation, there are three grant programs, the Exterior Rehabilitation Program at 1.15 million, the Demonstration Project Program at 1.275 million, Warehouse and Threatened Building Program, 1.775 million, and then two uh, city properties that need preservation work, the Orpheum Theater Exterior Rehabilitation Project, which is over 1.6 million, and finally the Heritage Square Facilities Restoration at about $650,000. Those are the items on the prioritized projects. Uh, there had been some discussion of uh, DUPA, but we need, ultimately we will need a complete defined list uh, and, and direction for what to move forward to prepare the survey tool for the subcommittee. Any comments from the subcommittee members? Okay. Hearing none. Uh, Mr. Chair, just, just so we're all clear, uh, w without further direction, what I'm understanding is that we would prepare the tool with the prioritized projects. Is that the direction? Is that the direction, members? Okay. Yes. Oh, I was going to make a motion. Yes. The addition of the DUPA. Please do. Uh, thank you, Mr. <laughs> Chairman. Uh, I was going to make a motion that we consider. Uh, in addition to the prioritized list that we have, the addition of the Dupa Adobe. Uh, so that's the, my motion. Is there a second? Dupa. I'll second. Okay. There's a, we have a motion and we have a second. Is there any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you very much. Um, our, Use your hand. You're the unit. Yeah, uh, 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 let me hear you. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, do we need to make a motion to direct you to, to do the uh, prioritize list with the tool, or is that something that you can just undertake? I am seeing our city attorney tell me that uh, we do not need a motion for that. Uh, staff will prepare the survey tool for the subcommittee with the prioritized projects plus the uh, DUPA structure. Um, we will have that submitted to the subcommittee early next week with very clear instructions on how to move forward and certainly contact information for staff if you encounter any difficulties. Any other questions or comments? Okay. Our next meeting is scheduled for September 16th at 1 p.m. Um, subcommittee members, please notify staff in advance if you have uh, any conflicts with the meeting. Okay. Um, if there's no other questions or comments, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you. And I really appreciate all the work that uh, the staff continues to do for the city of Phoenix. Thank you. Maricopa.edu slash R to R to start your route to relief journey. So thank you, Mayor Gallego and the city of Phoenix for this collaboration. I now like to turn the podium over to the mayor of the city of Phoenix, the Honorable Kate Gallego. Mayor. Thank you so much. Thank you to Susan Bittersmith and the entire board of the community colleges. It is so wonderful to be with you here today. We are hoping today is the start to, of career transformations for so many Phoenix residents.